So if your head isn't spinning yet, well, something's wrong with you. Yeah, this stuff is all pretty confusing. The good news is it's really kind of fascinatingly cool too. I hope this uh, mini lecture will convince you of that. Where are we? We're almost done. Uh, what we're covering in this mini lecture more or less are two things, the intramolecular aldols and the Robinson annulation. Section 18.9 is about um, not aldehyde or ketone aldols, but aldol type reactions with nitriles and nitro groups, and that is on your own. Pretty straightforward as long as you get aldols understood. So intramolecular aldol reactions. You know this whole thing, intramolecular aldol, it's nothing new. We have seen intramolecular from pretty close to the get-go. Whenever you have a nucleophile that is tethered to an electrophile, well, guess what? They're going to find each other. So a nucleophile, so far away, but within the same molecule as the electrophile, boom, there you go. And for example, what we've seen is, say, an alkyl halide electrophile and an alkoxide nucleophile tethered in the same molecule, well, then you get a cyclic ether. And one that we've particularly seen quite a bit is formation of an epoxide that way, okay, from a bromohydrin. So we've seen intramolecular reactions for, for, for forever. So there's nothing new about that. What's the big deal in this chapter is that aldols are particularly good at it, especially when you're looking at making five or six membered rings. That's the key. So whenever you have the possibility of an intramolecular reaction that can make a five or six membered ring, boom, it is going to happen in a heartbeat. So the example in the textbook is 6-oxoheptanyl, and the only reason I bring that up is because there's a, an error in your textbook. I don't know why, but they have a dash between the oxo and the heptanyl, and that shouldn't be there, so you can just cross that out in your book. The example we're going to go through is this guy here, pretty complicated looking. Mm, we can see there's ketones and aldehydes and that means there's the potential for enolates, so we have all the makings for an intramolecular reaction. Helpful hints when you're considering intramolecular aldol reactions. First of all, your nucleophiles, of course, are going to be your enolates, so you need to identify all your potential enolate nucleophiles. So I can have an enolate here, I can have an enolate here, I can have an enolate here. Those are all my potential nucleophiles. Then you basically just need to count. Given those potential nucleophiles, can any of those react to make a five or six membered ring? So here's my nucleophile. If I react with that electrophile, will I get a five membered ring? And it should be pretty evident that one, two, three, four, no, that is not a five-membered ring. That would give me a four-membered ring. So you're basically just going to look at the nucleophile and see what all it could possibly react with. And then finally, once you've identified all the possibilities, you're going to have to choose which one is the most favorable. Keep in mind things like you got to make a five- or six-membered ring and the fact that if you have a choice between a five- or six-membered ring being formed where the electrophile is an aldehyde, that's going to be happening much more quickly and therefore it's going to be more highly favored than the enolate reacting with a ketone. So let's go through this example, uh, the example in the green box, and I will illustrate how the most important thing probably is that you don't write down your product without numbering your carbons. So all right, here it is. We have this bifunctional, crazy, full of nucleophiles and electrophiles possibility reacting with a base, basic conditions. This is all telling me aldol, I'm going to make an enolate. So there's my base, and my choices here are to remove these alpha hydrogens or this alpha hydrogen 
or these alpha hydrogens. And I'm just going to squish them off over to the side here. All right, now see, notice that we're not talking about thermodynamic or, or um, kinetic enolates here. Right now, we have nothing to say this is anything but thermodynamic. It doesn't really matter in this case because what's going to govern the outcome is whether or not we can form a five or six membered ring. So let's clean all this up and just look at enolates. We've already identified that this one would just give us a four membered ring. Ixne there. Well, how about this one? If I deprotonate there, what do I get? Well, again, one, two, three, four. I'm making a four membered ring. It's not going to happen. Okay? Actually, that's not true. It will happen. I will absolutely positively deprotonate here. But this reaction, this elementary step to give me, let's see, this intermediate, right here. So I better number my carbons because I can't figure this out. Ooh. Okay, so one, two, three, four. So this is carbon one, two, three. So here is carbon four. So that's the one that has the oxygen on it. And the only other thing that's attached is a hydrogen. Well, that's not a very stable intermediate. And it is just going to go boom, boom, right back where it started from. So yes, it does happen. But this reversible reaction is going to you know, not play a big role because there's another option that leads to a much more stable outcome, a much more favorable outcome, and that is, of course, looking at this enolate and seeing what it does when it reacts with that electrophile. So numbering our carbons yet again, let's make these purple, one, two, three, four, five, magic number six. That is going to be a favorable elementary step because it's going to form a very stable six-membered intermediate. Now I'm stopping dead in my tracks here because what I want to do is number my carbons. One, two, three, four. All right, so then I had five and six. Five, six, six was the carbonyl. So what happened here is I'm making this new bond here. Carbon one has the propyl group attached. Carbon six is, was the carbonyl. There's the O minus. This is the new bond I just formed. And what we can see is we have the classic one three relationship between the hydro what will be the hydroxyl group and the carbonyl that screams aldol okay so there's my intermediate what happens next well i have nothing in my conditions about heat so that suggests that the dehydration is not necessarily taking place so the rest of the reaction would just be protonation of my alkoxide by ripping a proton off of my solvent, the methanol. So my product for this reaction is going to end up being this guy. There it is. And, you know, there were all kinds of possible outcomes, but far and away, this will be our major product. Now, this guy was exceptionally clever, so clever that he won the Nobel Prize for this. He realized that you can take the aldol and combine it with the Michael reaction and make very complicated organic scaffolds. So, this is, um, I think Sir Robert Robinson, if I remember correctly, handsome dude that he is. Like I said, he really, he was pretty clever. So 
looking at the Michael reaction, you, I hope, remember that what this is all about is addition of a soft enolate nucleophile, 1,4 in conjugate addition, to give you, after protonation of the intermediate, so here is our intermediate, so right here is where our bond was formed, here is our O minus enolate, here is the three carbon piece that we're adding. So here's our enolate intermediate and that gets protonated. Again probably by an alcohol or whatever protic solvent is present. There you go, that gives you the Michael product. And what this is, good reminder here is that the Michael product always has that 1,5 relationship of the dicarbonyls. So whenever you see that target, a 1,5 relationship between two carbonyls, you should say, hmm, I'll bet that was made by a Michael reaction. Well, so there's the Michael reaction. What Robinson came up with was the recognition that once you've made that Michael product, well, it's perfectly set up to do an, an intramolecular aldol reaction. So just looking at the 1,5 product here and thinking about the possible enolates, hmm, if I have an enolate there, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, perfect. So as soon as that Michael reaction product is formed, you get that intramolecular reaction between the enolate of the ketone and the aldehyde. You get the aldol product right here. And then in the E1CB mechanism, you lose your water to make the alpha beta unsaturated six membered ring a cyclohexenone. So that is what the Robinson annulation is all about, making cyclohexenones. What Robinson won the Nobel Prize for is that he figured out you would do this in one swell foop. So starting from a conjugated aldehyde and a ketone, under basic conditions, one swell foop, you can piece together a cyclohexenone in actually excellent yield. So an example that is shown on this page, whoa, this is really a complicated one, but it's so cool. Basically you see a kind of complex chiral starting material on the left, and well, in this case what we've got is a conjugated ketone. It's not a conjugated aldehyde, but this will work just as well. So there is our 1,4 acceptor, our Michael acceptor. So what we're talking about here is something is going to attack here. Well that something has to be an enolate of course. Well where are we going to get an enolate? Well our enolate is going to be formed right here. That's really the only choice we have. So basically we are asking to make a very complicated intramolecular reaction take place. That happens first, you get that addition and then the enolate will add to the aldehyde. Well, this is a complicated one. What does the product look like? Well, the product's so darn complicated that I didn't even feel like redrawing it. But here it is. It would be fun for you if you like a puzzle to kind of work backwards on this and see how, hmm, alright, so here is my six-membered cyclohexenone right there. I totally messed it up now. Or here is my six-membered cyclohexenone right there. Can you work backwards and see how, woo -hoo -hoo -hoo, this is really kind of a pain to draw. Doo -doo -doo, that goes there, this goes back here, whatever. How, so here it is, oh I see now. Here is this adding to this.
Very complicated. But anyhow, it's pretty impressive. 95% yield, that's not pretty impressive, that's phenomenal. And a question for you, 5 to 1 what? Are 9 and 9 prime enantiomers? Diastereomers? What does this mean? All right, as promised, I broke this into two, I hope, smaller mini lectures, so I'll wrap this one up quickly with a stupid, um, oh, well, ha, it's not wrapped up quite quickly. This is the, in the yellow box, this is the ultimate target that they were trying to make. And I think what you can see here is that basically this is the part that corresponds to our intramolecular Michael Aldol Robinson annulation. Okay, so yes, I'm going to wrap it up with a stupid meme. I'm sure you've seen this before, but it's so appropriate. I only make jokes about chemistry periodically. All right, one last mini lecture and then we'll see you in class.